You are listening to C-Suite Perspectives, a podcast series from the Conference Board, providing business leaders with trusted insights for what's ahead. Hello and welcome to this episode of C-Suite Perspectives, a new podcast series by the Conference Board. This conversation will take an objective, data-driven look at a range of timely topics that matter most to business executives. To help make sense of these topics and how they'll unfold, we'll sit down for each podcast with thought leaders and do what we do best, which is to provide insights for what's ahead. I'm Steve Odlin, the CEO of the Conference Board and the host of this podcast series, and I'm very pleased to kick off the show today with our chief economist and the head of our Economy Strategy and Finance Center, Dana Peterson. Dana, welcome. Hi, Steve. It's great to be here. Great. And Dana, you know, this is the last Tuesday of every month. And as we both know, that's a special day at the conference board because it means that we are releasing our much anticipated U.S. Consumer Confidence Survey. The results came out today. Talk to us about what the results told us. Absolutely, Steve. Great news all around. Consumers are continuing to gain confidence as vaccines are being distributed. Mobility restrictions are being lifted by governments. And also as jobs are being added, uh, certainly the labor market is starting to heat up a little bit. Our overall confidence gauge actually rose to the highest level we've seen since February of last year. The present situation index spiked upward and expectations are now slightly above pre-pandemic levels. So confidence is up across large swaths of the nation. When we look at different states, also across different age groups, both young and old at heart, as well as across different incomes. So what's driving this increase in confidence? Sure. Well, I mean, consumers are confident about business conditions as well as the current state of the labor market. These sentiments are definitely consistent with continued healing in the labor market that we're seeing, as well as mobility restrictions being lifted across uh, the U.S. Perceptions of future income, which had been pretty morose over the last few months, have actually improved. And most notably, consumers are looking to buy things. They're looking to look buy houses and also the big ticket items like cars and appliances that go along with homes. And I would say most notably, consumers are looking to go on vacation with aims to travel both in the U.S. as well as abroad. So that means they have to get on a plane. Although uh, short-term inflation expectations do remain elevated with gasoline and food prices, that gauge uh, actually stabilized in April. At least it looks like it might have. Also for now, these higher prices don't seem to be putting a dent uh, or a major dent in sentiment. Well, we're going to come back and talk about uh, in- inflation in a bit. But, and you talked about the big ticket spending, but the U.S. GDP is made up of what? It's about 70% total consumer spending. Some of that's cars and appliances and, and capital goods, but a lot of it's day-to-day. What, uh, what do you think the increase in consumer confidence means for day-to-day spending and which industries are going to benefit? Sure. Well, I think it certainly bodes well for a rotation in spending. Uh, We think people are still going to buy goods, but now they're going to start buying in-person services, going to get their hair done, um, (laughs) going on vacation, and also going out to malls and engaging in in in-person shopping. And we think that this will all be fueled not only by reopenings, but also that third round of of federal uh, fiscal supports. Uh, Many people even though they saved about two thirds of it, people still plan on spending a third, which is still a lot of money and would contribute to the 6% rate of growth we forecast for this year in the US economy. When we look at industries, clearly manufacturing and especially the tech sector should continue to benefit from very strong household sentiment. But we think services industries, including hotels and restaurants, personal travel, discretionary healthcare, and possibly also brick and mortar retail like I mentioned, these industries all stand to benefit from rising consumer confidence. Well, you know, as we know, the GDP is made up of, uh, as I said, 70% the consumer, but it's about, what, 25% government spending in total. And you mentioned the, uh, you know, some of the tax plans. The, the White House and Congress are talking about a big infrastructure plan. They're talking about uh, big tax plans to pay for it. Talk about the, uh, what's in these plans and what it means for the economy. Sure, absolutely. Over the last uh, couple of weeks, the administration has launched like two or three big plans. Um, A few weeks ago, they announced the American Jobs Plan, along with that, the Made in America Tax Plan. And the American Jobs Plan aims to increase spending, government spending on infrastructure, but also on manufacturing and R&D 
and care and housing for elders. So there's a big, there's a lot of stuff tossed in there, kind of kitchen sink and not all of its infrastructure. And the administration is hoping to pass this with raising corporate taxes. So if the taxes go up on corporations, what do the corporations do then? What, what actions do they have to take? Well, uh, corporations have some tough choices. Uh, certainly some can potentially mitigate some of the tax increase, but for others, let's say that some of them may absorb it into their profit margins, but other firms are going to be faced with a tough choice, maybe reducing uh, labor force or not investing um, or even passing some of those higher taxes on to consumers in the form of prices. Yeah, and if that happens, then of course, Inflation occurs, and we'll come back and talk about that. But if their earnings decline, then, of course, that puts a risk into the stock market, doesn't it? It sure does. I remember back in uh, right before the uh, 2017 uh, tax cuts went through, you know, even a year ahead of that, stock markets really rallied on the prospect of tax cuts. So I would imagine that if tax hikes become a real prospect, that markets might be affected. But, you know, again, it depends on how much uh, taxes are raised, if at all. And again, there's a lot of speculation in terms of whether or not these plans would be passed in Congress, a a lot of uncertainty. But certainly, um, we do look at these plans in terms of what the potential effects might be on the U.S. economy. Yeah, and if the taxes don't go through to pay for it, but the spending goes through, well, then you have increased deficits, and we're already at, you know, pretty record levels of debt. So what does that mean over the long run? Sure. Even if you have some taxes, this this bill, uh, it's not a bill, but these two plans put together suggest that you might have a a deficit that's $1.1 trillion higher over the next 10 years. And what does that mean for debt? That means that public debt as a share of GDP might rise to as much as 117%. That would be an all-time high and well above the average that we've seen since 1940, (laughs) which includes World War II. Um, that average was close to 48% of GDP. So 117% of GDP um, could potentially be might ne- quite negative. Financial markets might start to punish the U.S. by raising interest rates, the cost of borrowing. We could potentially see inflation also crowding out, certainly as, as private investment, uh, well, private dollars uh, go towards financing these outsized federal budget deficits um, and debt through purchases of U.S. Treasury. So there certainly are a lot of negative implications to outsized debt and deficits. Yeah, and you know the dollar is used as the world's reserve currency. You know, I I, I, got, I have to imagine that if the debt rises to 117 percent or higher of the GDP, it calls into question you know the, the long term stability of the dollar and whether in fact it deserves to be the reserve currency. Well, it certainly does call into question. But the key thing is, what's the next reserve currency? Presently and even potentially you know, over the next five to ten years, you know there there aren't any clear runner-ups here. But certainly, when you look at things like cryptocurrencies, uh, central banks are looking at this. There could be potential that there could be a shift away from the U.S. dollar and towards these kind of private currencies. Well, maybe that's why I'm seeing all these gold commercials on television, Dana. They're, <laughs> it's, it's gold. Buy gold. It's like a gold rush all over again. Well, back to this, you know, these spending plans, you know, the infrastructure plans are kind of exciting in the sense, you know, if anybody's listening who drives a car or, you know, takes public transportation, we know that uh, our systems are outdated. But but it also has, an, it's kind of exciting economically if you set aside, you know, how we pay for it, because it, it really is a shot in the arm to the economy, isn't it? It certainly can be, especially over the longer term. When we look at our infrastructure right now, it gets a grade of about a C minus. And that's not mine. That's um, a group of of civil engineers gave that uh, grade. It's very negative, very low. Um, So certainly fixing what's broken as well as building out new infrastructure, potentially infrastructure that benefits technological advancements and certainly broadband internet, um, fixing, uh, creating new roads, and certainly uh, including elements of maybe green technology. All these things suggest great prospects, certainly if we can fix the capital stock in the U.S. And certainly I can, you know, spend less on new tires. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that uh, it is exciting. It just, you just wish that you, uh, we had more money to pay for it and we didn't have to take taxes up and all the other 
you know, little tiny little things to deal with it. Um, anyway, the, uh, Dana, we've got some new data from the conference board on productivity, but we're going to take a short break and be right back with our chief economist of the conference board, Dana Peterson. Interested in this content? You can find this and much more at our conference board website, www.conference-board.org. Or even better, contact our membership team and your company can enjoy the benefits of our in-depth research around the economy, environmental, social, and governance issues, public policy, marketing and communications, and human capital. As a member of the conference board, you will be able to have full access to all of our cutting edge research, leading indicators, benchmarking and data services, in addition to webcasts and podcasts such as the one you are enjoying now. Hello and welcome back to C-Suite Perspectives. I'm your host, Steve Odland, the CEO of the Conference Board, and we're joined today by our chief economist of the Conference Board, Dana Peterson. Dana, you know, this, this global productivity data that uh, has just come out is, uh, is, is really interesting, and I know you've been writing and talking about it. You know, what are you seeing in the data? Sure. This is a great segue, especially from talking about infrastructure. Productivity globally has been very disappointing. Over the last decade, growth, uh, whether you measure it in terms of output per worker or output per hour, has been weak. And this reflects a number of factors. It certainly reflects the fact that uh, we've had weak economic activity since the great financial crisis. There's been a limited adoption of new technologies. There's been a lack of investments in new business models, modern infrastructure, and human capital for the 21st century. I mean, and really, when we look at 2020, the story was a little different. Um, And that's because global productivity slowed from 0.9%, sorry, slowed to 0.9% in 2020 from 1% in 2019. Still, uh, however, we think we might have hit a nadir, hit a bottom here uh, in terms of the extended trend of weak productivity growth especially for mature economies like the U.S. and Europe. Okay, Dana, I, I, I have to ask you, what the heck is productivity? What, what does this mean? Sure. <laughs> so productivity um, is if you take GDP and you divide it by either the number of workers or the number of hours, it's a measure of how effective or how efficient the economy is. Um, and when we talk about productivity in terms of GDP growth, we talk about something called total factor productivity, and that's really just the sum total of all your past investments in technology, new business models, human capital, and the capital stock. So, for example, in the U.S., fixing the nation's existing infrastructure and building new infrastructure using the latest technology would improve the, the capital stock and thereby improve productivity and contribute to growth ahead. So is it, you know, it's it fair to simplify this and say, you know, you get more per hour of, uh, of labor worked at, or, you know, you get more output with the same resources, essentially, right? And so, you know, this was the whole digital revolution. It was going to make us all that much more pro- uh, productive. And in fact, we saw for uh, a long period of time that uh, it, it increases in productivity. So getting more out of those resources contributed what, 100 or 200 basis points to GDP. And the issue is that that's kind of, that kind of dried up, you know, over the past decade. And, and so economists have been worried about that, right? Yes. And I mean, a lot of it has to do with massive underinvestment during the great financial, well, post the great financial crisis. You just had a lot of uncertainty. And so businesses were not willing to invest Governments were, you know, shortly after stimulating economies during the great financial crisis, they engaged in fiscal austerity. So you didn't see uh, government dollars going towards productive things like fixing roads and bridges. And also, when you look at technology, there have been major leaps in technology, but businesses haven't always adopted them. However, we're pretty optimistic that over the longer run, that businesses are going to start adopting these things, things like AI. Uh, machine learning, even using telephones more effectively. And even when we look back over the last year at the pandemic, there's been a massive amount of adoption of new technologies. Just, I mean, we're having this conversation right now remotely. So that means we're deploying computers in new and imaginative ways. And so for those reasons, we're optimistic that productivity can pick up globally over the next decade. 
Yeah, and so you know, we were talking in the U.S. about uh, sort of the new normal of GDP growth being closer to one percent, and that was because largely because of the lack of productivity gains. But now, you know, what I hear you saying is that we're a little bit more bullish on this, and we're starting to see productivity pick up. And if that's the case, maybe we can get a sustained growth rate of two to three percent. Well, um, maybe two percent. <laughs> I mean, potential. Uh, I knew you were going to hedge that. <laughs> right. Um, I think uh, certainly if we do have, you know, investments, both private sector and productive government investments in research and development, in new manufacturing and preserving energy resources in infrastructure that we can potentially raise the potential GDP or the potential output of the country, which means that maybe we won't be running, you know, close to 1%, but maybe closer to 2% or maybe even better over the longer term. But again, it really depends upon these investments. And more people contribute to the uh, to the output as well. The latest census data just came out, and it we're growing at in, in the U.S. Uh, at less than one percent. So, you know, there's not enough labor coming in, and uh, you know, so there's all there's, there's a lot of contribution to this. But uh, so what are you saying? You're saying six percent GDP growth this year, and then you know two percent kind of thereafter. So, um, right, right around those numbers. Well, absolutely, six percent this year. Maybe next year, close to three and a half, and then thereafter. Yeah, yeah then, pretty close then, to two percent. Then it comes down. So, uh, party like it's it's twenty twenty one, right? Oh, wait, it is the. Uh, <laughs> okay, we've got to we've got to get back to my favorite subject, and uh, uh, my favorite subject uh, meaning inflation, and and this is because Dana and I keep having this this great debate about inflation. And, I, you know, Dana, I'm worried about inflation because I, I hear from every sector, you know, car prices are going up, housing prices are skyrocketing, food prices are going up, gas prices. Where does it end? What does this mean? Sure. Um, certainly when the economy is growing at 6%, you're going to see inflation. And also, you know, there are different types of inflation. There's inflation that producers face, um, businesses, inflation that consumers face. And then there's also asset price inflation. And certainly we're seeing pockets of inflation in all of these areas for companies, consumers, and in asset prices. But we have anticipated higher inflation in our forecasts. And indeed, if our forecasts are wrong and we have even stronger growth, then we'd have to also up our inflation expectations. But I would say that, um, well, maybe you want to weigh in here. <laughs> no, you know, I, I look, I, I, I hope it's under control because... You know, when the when the inflation starts exceeding two percent, which is the Fed level, then what happens? They start raising interest rates, and that that increases the cost of borrowing and and so forth. So there, you should you know talk about all of the knock on effects if you know if inflation does get uh, uh, you know above Fed benchmarks. One thing I would say a few things. Well, the first is a lot of this inflation is transitory. I mean, some of it is permanent. But there are some transitory factors that are creating faster inflation for companies, uh, consumers, and also in asset prices. Transitory factors include strong demand for goods amid the pandemic. Everybody ran out and bought cars and bicycles and technology. And certainly that caused uh, backups in supply chains and also in shipping, right? And these things uh, raise the cost for producers and producers are passing some of that on to households. So we're seeing goods price inflation. As the economy reopens, we in the U.S. and globally, we should expect that prices for services may also rise. We're also seeing, we're in fact, we're seeing those prices rise for airline tickets, which is actually a great sign that people want to get on a plane. Again, a lot of these things are pandemic related. And just going back to the supply chain disruptions, um, initially last year, that was because businesses uh, shut down or people were getting sick. Now it's more so, you know, incidences like the Suez Canal um, or, you know, ships approaching the port, but then they can't be unloaded. And then once they're unloaded, there's no one to truck it anywhere. A lot of those things are going to fade as the pandemic itself fades. But there are some things that are permanent, we think. So, for example, the chip shortage, that's not going to be resolved overnight. It takes five to 10 years to build a new factory to make chips. You're, you're talking about computer computer chips, which is uh, hammering the auto industry right now because they, yes. they can't get enough to uh, make cars. Exactly. But that, you know, that's something that's not going to be resolved overnight. And that's going to have uh, downwind effects 
on the auto industry. Um, so we should anticipate that you know prices for, for cars should remain elevated. Also housing. Indeed, the pandemic did prompt many people to seek larger homes and also remote work is not going anywhere. And so more people may be looking to work from home. So those factors suggest that we're going to continue to see upward pressure in, in asset prices in terms of housing. Um, but I would also suggest that there are a variety of factors that have weighed down prices over the last 20 years. And many of those factors are still present and will help moderate prices once the pandemic disruptions fade. For example, consumers are still looking for deals and they're not gonna to tolerate big price increases. So firms can go, but so far in terms of raising prices. However, you know, like I said, I think strong demand for housing may continue beyond the pandemic. But what about the Fed? Well, the Fed has actually changed its tune in terms of how it views inflation. Years ago, the Fed um, would say, well, we want to act and raise interest rates before we see any inflation pressures. Now the Fed is saying, we actually want to see inflation. We're fine with seeing the whites of the eyes of inflation. The Fed said that it's fine with seeing consumer price inflation, less food and energy, rise above the 2% target and stay above 2% for some period of time. The Fed didn't say how high or for how long, but that's materially different. And so both we and the Fed have those inflation gauges rising above 2% for a period of time. And the Fed is saying it's fine with that. But certainly if we see inflation that's you know, you know, two and a half, three percent for a prolonged period, the Fed is likely to raise interest rates faster. Yeah. And, and you know, the inflation is tough on particularly the elderly who are on a fixed income because, uh, you know, that doesn't go up necessarily. And, uh, and their money doesn't go as far. But, you know, the, it, the other thing is, is wages. And uh, you, you've written and mentioned that, uh, you know, minimum wage increases you know, really don't have a huge effect. But certainly as uh, labor shortages begin to uh, rise again, as, you know, labor g gets reabsorbed into the economy, that's going to put upward pressure on, on wages. So you've got a lot of things that, uh, you know, that are out there to worry about. But, uh, but at this point, people seem to be relatively calm. Yes, and I would say that, you know, wage wage pressures can be driven by a number of things, right? They can be driven by shortages of labor, right? Which is what we're kind of we're seeing in certain industries. But it also so it can be a sign of health of the economy, right? So next year, if we see unemployment rates back, you know, towards four, three percent, and many people who are out of work now, they in the, in the US, the eight point four million people are out of work are yeah. working, then some wage pressures are a sign of a healthy economy. Yeah, no, that's right. But, you know, then then, then you've got the whole remote work thing. You know, we've been remote here for uh, over a year because of the pandemic, but people are saying uh, we're going to stay remote. That's going to help lower some costs. And, uh, you know, talk about uh, the impact of that on inflation, wages and everything else. Sure, absolutely. I think remote work is actually disinflationary. Uh, for a number of reasons. For consumers or for households, it means, well, you don't have to spend as much on going to work. You don't have to <laughs> spend on dry cleaning or putting gas in the car or buying a, you know, a transportation uh, check. So that is, can lower prices for, for your average household. And for businesses, remote work can also help lower costs of having real estate, office space. Um, and also you can seek out laborers who are working in lower cost jurisdictions around the country. And in some cases may even seek labor outside of the country. So yes, a remote work could be <laughs> an offset to uh, increasing wages for other reasons. Yeah, it's really an interesting time. And uh, I think this whole, you know, the pandemic has been tragic in many ways, but, uh, but it has really vaulted the digital economy and the digital transformation and, and all of these things. And it sure is nice to see positive GDP numbers after you know, what was really a, a tragic uh, period last year. Well, thank you, uh, Dana. We've been, uh, we've been talking to Dana Peterson, the chief economist of the conference board. Thanks for, for joining us and providing our listeners with a roundup of insights on the state and trajectory of the economy. Each month, I'm going to be joined by a different leader, both at the conference board and also CEOs in various industries to talk about a variety of subjects. We've hoped you've enjoyed this podcast, C-Suite Perspectives, and that you'll listen and share this with your colleagues as your business tackles the challenges brought about by this fast-paced and uncertain time. 
I'm Steve Odlin, and this podcast has been brought to you by the Conference Board. You've been listening to C-Suite Perspectives, a podcast series from the Conference Board that delivers trusted insights for what's ahead to the nation's business leaders. Find this podcast and others from the Conference Board wherever you find your podcasts.